In this video, I'll talk about sections two and three of chapter two. We're gonna focus on the second half of our goals here. We will continue to work on which table, chart, or graph should be used for a given analysis. We'll work on bar charts, pie charts, and stem and leaf diagrams. You'll also learn to create a line chart and interpret the trend in the data and construct a histogram and determine the relationship between the graphed variables. So I brought this picture in again so that we could look at it. Remember page 77 from the textbook. We're going to be focusing on stem and leaf diagrams, scatter plots. Those go with quantitative cross-sectional data. We'll also be looking at line charts and bar charts. Those are used to describe time series quantitative data. Also, bar charts and pie charts are used to describe categorical or qualitative data. So section two of the book talks about bar charts, pie charts, and stem and leaf diagrams. We'll start with the charts and graphs you use to describe categorical data, bar charts and pie charts. Then we'll move on to a discussion of stem and leaf diagram, which we use to describe quantitative data. Bar charts, as you may recall, typically present categorical data where the bars represent the relative importance or some other measure of that data. The bars can be vertical or horizontal. Here's an example of a bar chart. So we have information from car companies, General Motor, Ford, Chrysler, and so on. And we see their January 2012 sales. You can look at this in the table and get lots of good information out of it. But a bar chart will often allow you to see things in a way that just seeing numbers in a table does not do. We use a bar chart here because we have different categories and we're trying to compare the relative importance of each of these categories. You notice the automobile manufacturers are along the horizontal axis and the sales are on the vertical axis and the height of each bar represents the sales for that company. How do we create a bar chart? Well, we start by defining the categories of interest. So in the last slide, we were looking at the different automobile manufacturers. We treated each of them as if it was the category we were interested in knowing about. For each category, determine an appropriate measure. In the last slide, we were trying to compare the sales figures across those different manufacturers. So we use the 2012 sales. If you're gonna do a column chart like we just did, the categories go on the horizontal axis. For a horizontal bar chart, the categories would go on the vertical axis. And then the bars represent the values for each category. Then you would interpret the results. So we can see that GM had the most sales of any manufacturer in our list. You also notice that Mazda had the lowest sales. A second example of a bar chart using horizontal bars Suppose that we were interested in looking at an individual investor's portfolio, and that individual had about $47,000 in stocks, $32,000 in bonds, and so on. We could look at this graph and say, this individual is invested in primarily risky investments. We know that stocks are risky relative to bonds, CDs, and savings. So this bar chart can be displayed vertically, or horizontally. Pie charts, you know, are a graph that's in the shape of a circle. Each slice of the pie corresponds to a category or a class that we're trying to display. The size of the slice of that pie is really supposed to represent how big that class is compared to the whole. So when we do a pie chart, all the slices of the pie should make up the whole and each slice of the pie should represent proportionally how big that slice of the pie is. So we've got an example here of a survey of 300 golfers. The survey asks the golfers to say which technological change has had the biggest impact on the game of golf. So if you add up these numbers, you get 300 responses. It's the total, all 300. Some said the golf ball, some said the shaft material, some said, I don't know, I just love to go drink beer and play golf. We use these numbers here to generate this graph. So you can see 27% of the respondents said golf balls, 
81 divided by 300 would give us that 27%. We see golf balls is the biggest response. Club head material and shaft material, club size, also important. Each slice of the pie tells us the relative proportion of people who responded with that particular technological change. How do we construct a pie chart? It's a lot like a bar chart. We start by defining the categories of interest. For each category, we determine the appropriate measure or value, just like we did before. The computer will automatically turn those categories into proportions. So you don't actually have to worry about doing that calculation yourself. As long as you have those values listed in a column, when you highlight them and create the pie chart, the pie chart will automatically display those proportions. So the last step is to construct that pie chart, where each slice is proportional to that category's relative importance. And then of course, like any other chart, we would interpret our results. A stem and leaf diagram is probably new to most of you. We use a stem and leaf diagram to see distribution information from a quantitative set of data. How is a stem and leaf diagram constructed? We start by sorting the data from low to high. We look at the data and say, okay, how are we going to split this data up? And by split the data up, I mean actually take each number and split up the numbers. Then we list all the possible stems in a single column from low to high, and we list all the leaves associated with each stem. So here's an example. This is the same temperature data that we used in the last video. In this case, I have just tens and ones places. So I'm going to take the tens place, and that's going to be my stem. I have 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. So I write down the left column, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The leaves are all the values in the ones place. And if a number is repeated, we repeat it in the stem and leaf diagram. So you'll notice 12, 13, 17. I put 1 here, 2 to represent the 12, 3 to represent the 13, 7 for the 17. You'll notice that there are two 24s. So I have 2, 1 for 21, 4 for 24, 4 for 24, and so on. This allows us to see sort of that same thing that we saw with the histogram, but it gives us a little bit more information. It tells us actually that there are repeats. It tells us where in the class those values happen to be. If we're looking at the stem 3 for 30, we can see that more than half of the days that it was 30, it was 35 or over. Section 3 of this chapter talks about two things that we use to describe quantitative data, line charts and scatter diagrams. A line chart is a chart where we put time on the horizontal axis and the variable of interest on the vertical axis. And when we use a line chart, we're going to see a time trend, if there is one. A scatter diagram allows us to plot two variables against each other so that we can see if there's a relationship between the two variables. So an example of a line chart, the US inflation rate. In Econ 200, you would have talked about inflation. So we see different inflation rates in different time periods. How do we actually construct this line chart? Well, we identify the variable of interest. This is going to be a time series variable. We determine the minimum and maximum values and the range of time periods covered in the data. That's going to allow us to set up the axes properly. Construct the horizontal axis to represent time periods and the vertical axis to represent the variable of interest, ensuring that the scale matches the range of values for our variable. Then you plot the points and connect the points with a straight line. Analyze the trend in the data. Over time, what is happening with that variable. The scatter diagram is also called a scatter plot. It allows us to see the relationship between two quantitative variables. So we have special names for those variables. The dependent variable is the variable we're interested in learning about. It's the thing that we think is responding to other variables. So we believe its values are a function of other variables. 
The independent variable are variables that we believe impact the values of that dependent variable. An example of that could be production and cost. We look at this table, we have how many units of output were being produced per day and the cost per day. It makes sense that the cost is determined by how many items we produce. So this is a scatter plot showing the volume produced and the associated cost. You notice that I did not connect the points here. We never connect the points in a scatter diagram. We may put in here a regression line, and the regression line will give us an idea of the relationship between the two variables. However, I can just look at this graph and see it appears that as volume goes up, the cost per day is going up. Notice how that line goes up and to the right. So how do we actually construct a scatter diagram? We have to figure out what the two variables are that we believe are related to each other and collect paired responses for those variables. Determine which variable should go on the y-axis, that's always your dependent variable, and determine which variable should be placed on the horizontal axis, that's your independent variable. Define the range of values for each variable and define the appropriate scale. That again allows us to make a graph that makes sense. Then we're going to plot the xy pairs for each of those variables. In Excel, you can do this very easily if you make sure that your x variable is on the left and the y variable is on the right in the spreadsheet. Then when you highlight them to put them into a scatter plot, they'll go on the appropriate axes. The last step is to analyze the relationship between the two variables. Is there an increasing relationship or a decreasing relationship? Or maybe those two variables are not related at all. So we'll go back to the chart from page 77 and just sort of summarize here. If we have data that is quantitative and cross-sectional, we can summarize that data using frequency distributions, relative frequency distributions, and so on. We can also use histograms, stem and leaf diagrams, scatter diagrams, and the ogive that we talked about in the last video. With time series data, we primarily summarize that data in a line chart or in a bar chart. And we usually use a vertical bar chart for that. With qualitative data, we can use the frequency distribution, the relative frequency distribution, and the joint frequency distribution. We can also use bar charts, either vertical or horizontal bars, and pie charts.